Hello again, professional writers. A couple weeks ago, we began our discussion of research and citation by viewing the slideshow for locating sources. This week, we'll move on to the next part of the topic, documenting sources. The previous slideshow described how we find research, and now that you've located sources and begun drafting your white paper, we'll consider how we use research in our writing. In this week's slideshow, I'll provide an overview of citation styles and methods, a distinction among summary, paraphrase, and direct quotation, a discussion of in-text and works-cited documentation, then a few words about plagiarism. Source citation can be confusing as if it's a bunch of arbitrary and rigid rules. However, like with much of writing, citation comes to feel like second nature once we gain more practice. Your white paper should serve as a training ground for source work, a technique you'll apply in many of your upper level courses. You aren't expected to know everything just yet, but through this process, you'll become more expressive and efficient with your citations. Everything here is meant to complement Appendix A of our textbook. If you'll be doing a lot of writing in your major, you might want to supplement this information with a writing handbook, such as the St. Martin's or the Little Brown or Penguin handbooks. But for our needs with the white paper assignment, this slideshow in our textbook should be the only resources you'll need. We also offer assistance through the UAF Writing Center, which I'll describe in more detail later. In short, we incorporate source material through three methods, summary, paraphrase, and direct quotation. When we think of citing sources, most often we think of direct quotation, which is when you use another writer's exact words. That's the easiest method to recognize, since it uses quotation marks and calls attention to itself on the page. Yet students sometimes quote too much, dropping in long verbatim passages only to make their papers longer. On pages 388 and 389, our textbook notes that writers should quote the least amount that gets your point across, and that writers should use a direct quotation only when necessary. Why is that? When we reproduce the words of other writers, we might lose our own voice in the writing. Alternately, when we summarize and paraphrase, we put the ideas of others into our own words. As for citation, we employ two practices, in-text identifiers, which are the parentheses that indicate source material, and works cited entries, which are the bibliographic capsules at the end of a document. These two citations, in-text and works cited, should cross-reference one another. If you cite something in parentheses, you'll include a works cited entry for that source on the final page. If you have a works cited entry, you'll also have an in-text citation for it in the body of your paper. On page 393 of our textbook, we have a section that shows how to format parenthetical references in MLA style. Then on page 394, we have a section for formatting works cited entries. Similar guidelines for APA style are given on pages 404 and 405. For your white paper, you can choose any citation style you like. No matter which, you should make sure your citations are correct and consistent. So which style should you choose? First, I'd pick the one with which you're already familiar. Odds are that's MLA style. But if you know that in your major, you'll need to use a different style, you can use the white paper as an opportunity to get more practice in it. As this slide indicates, you have quite a few citation systems to choose from. And while they can seem arbitrary and complex, they follow patterns that you internalize with practice. Yet you don't need them all. For instance, I've never written or read anything in IEEE, which uses brackets within the text to refer to EndNote bibliography entries. When I was an undergraduate, I was made to use the Turabian manual, though I've hardly seen it used since. The most popular are MLA and APA, which are the two presented in Appendix A of our textbook. For the examples in the remainder of this slideshow, I've formatted the in-text citations according to MLA style. Again, if you're not sure which style to use for your white paper, go with MLA. But if you want to inquire about the styles in your major, you can email your advisor or the chair of your department and ask. That said, don't lose any sleep about the citation method for your white paper. Plus, you'll never really memorize all the idiosyncrasies of one citation system. In my writing, I need to look things up in reference books all the time. And it's only once I finish a full, near final draft of something that I'll go back and standardize my citations. I'm careful not to let the concerns of correctness prevent me from finishing my first drafts. 
Now onto the discussion of how we incorporate research into our writing. When you aren't using the exact words from your source, but rather putting those ideas into your own words, you're either summarizing or paraphrasing. The strategies are the same, but these terms differ depending on how much you're translating. Summary is defined as when you condense someone else's text into a briefer version that gives the main ideas of the original. Paraphrase is when you reword someone else's text using about the same number of words. The difference is in how much of the original you're putting into your own words. When you recap an entire argument in a few sentences, you're summarizing. When you describe an idea or passage in about the same space, you're paraphrasing. It might help to think of summaries as the text on the back of a book, while paraphrases are the cliff notes or spark notes. Summaries are useful when you need to provide context for a source with which your readers will be unfamiliar. Say I'm describing an article or documentary you haven't seen. I want to explain the basics in a few sentences so you'll know why it matters. Summaries also occur, occur in literature reviews, an upper-level writing exercise where you discuss your previous research on a subject. By contrast, paraphrasing is useful for smaller-scale passages, especially those where the original wording is numerical, technical, or complicated. It might seem easier to just retype a passage from your source, thus making a direct quote, but by paraphrasing, you can more easily interpret the passage and relate it to your argument. Here's how summary and paraphrase look in practice. In writing a summary, you can follow this formula. In, title, author, signal verb, etc. Examples of signal verbs would be describes, details, or argues. Remember, your summary is in service of your reader. We want to be concise and we want your reader to feel they understand the thesis or informational content of your chosen source. For instance, in this first summary, I've identified the genre, article, title, how smartphones hijack our minds, author, Nicholas Carr, and the general ideas of the article, the latest research, etc. Now when I quote from Carr's article later in my paper, readers will already know the basics about it. In this next example, I do away with that formula and splice my summary within the sentence. Like life deals with themes of young womanhood in a patriarchal culture. The rest of the sentence introduces the author, Lori Moore, title, like life, and the genre of the work, short story collection. This sentence looks different from the first one, but the intent is the same, to provide an overview of a source for unfamiliar readers. As you can imagine, summaries defy parenthetical citations of page numbers. That's because they're stating information from the text as a whole. For that reason, they don't refer to any one passage, and we only need to make sure the source is clear within our sentence. For paraphrasing, we'll look at an original passage and see how we could reword it. This sentence provides statistical data about McDonald's restaurants in Hong Kong. There's nothing wrong with this sentence as it is, but imagine we need to provide contextual information, like the date of these statistics. We could rewrite the sentence to include the year of publication and the author's name. In 2010, at the time of Watson's writing, dot, dot, dot. We acknowledge these statistics might be a little outdated, but they're still relevant. We could also imagine presenting them as a bar graph, a visual data display. In theory, that's just another type of paraphrasing. You see that I've noted the author's name, Watson, within my sentence, and the page number of his statistics in parentheses at the end of the sentence. Presumably, then, I'll also have a works cited entry for Watson's article. Yet, in this paraphrase, we see a small problem. The words, for every 42,000 residents, are re repeated verbatim. If we aren't using quotation marks, we shouldn't reproduce strings of words from the original. Doing so indicates a low-level plagiarism called patch writing. Keep that idea in mind. We'll return to it in a few slides. Here's one more example of a paraphrase. The original discusses the conventions of email. It's a nice couple sentences, but there's nothing special about them. Yet perhaps the writer is a leading thinker in the field of workplace communications, and citing her ideas will grant us extra credibility. 
In our paraphrase, we might introduce her and then restate her ideas. Although we're taking this passage out of context, we can see how the citation operates. First, Amanda Chong is noted as the source within the sentence. Second, the parentheses list the page number where Chong asserted her claim. And with that information, a reader could cross-reference the citation with your works cited page and find the details about Chong's book or article. Instead of paraphrasing, you could also directly quote Chong's passage. We want a good balance of the two, and no approach is necessarily better than the other. It just depends on your needs within your report. This slide offers a list of signal verbs, which are commonly used in summary. An author admits, asserts, concludes, implies, observes. These are strong verbs and using them will lead to strong direct sentences. By employing them, you'll naturally choose a concise identifiable sentence subject, the author or the title of the work. And you'll have a more active verb than is or another form of to be. One minor side note, signal verbs are written in the present tense in MLA style, for instance, Robertson declares, but they're written in past tense in APA style, Robertson declared. Once again, that's nothing to lose sleep over. For now, let's just recognize the need for sentences with clear subjects and strong verbs. In discussing paraphrasing, I mentioned the problem of patch writing. Patch writing is the practice of retaining the sentence structure and or words or phrases from an original source, often without citation. It happens when a student alters a passage instead of rewriting it in one's own words. Here we see an excerpt about the role of critical care nurses. Imagine a student wants to use this information in his report, but rather than directly quote it, he's going to paraphrase. This is what a patch written paraphrase looks like. The underlined phrases are all verbatim from the original. They're presented as though they're the student's own words, although they aren't. The student does identify his source, Chase 1995, so he's not trying to plagiarize. Yet as the italicized part on the bottom of the page says, the underlined phrases are falsely presented as the student's own. I'll highlight the borrowed phrases in the original passage. I can imagine how the patch writing came to be. The student pasted the full passage from Chase into his report, but it was too long to directly quote, so he chose to rewrite it. In doing so, he cut, pasted, and created a Frankenstein mashup of the original. Most of the resulting paragraph was his own words, yet patches of the original remained. Is it plagiarism? Yes, but to a lesser degree than if the student had pasted in the full paragraph or had failed to indicate Chase as the original source. As an instructor, I'd knock off a couple letter grades from the patch written report. The student's intentions are good, but his execution is bad and lazy and perhaps deceptive. The best way to avoid patch writing is to set aside the original source entirely when we're writing. Doing so forces us to use only our own words. Another option would be to put quotations around the underlined passages in the bottom paragraph. Although that would be distracting, too many small phrases, none of which are all that special, it would properly indicate they're from another source. When we use another writer's exact words, we call that direct quotation. To indicate they're someone else's words, we put them into quotation marks. It's most effective when the original wording is worth repeating or makes its point so well that no rewording will do it justice. We quote frequently in literature courses since we need to cite passages from stories and essays in our analyses. But I suspect direct quotation is less common outside the humanities, where field work and empirical studies are used more often as research methods. The challenge with direct quotation is keeping things short so that you don't lose your own voice as writer. I believe readers tend to skim ahead when they see a long quoted passage. Like images taken from elsewhere, we shouldn't use quotations just to fill space. And we face the challenge of incorporating quoted passages without disrupting the flow of our own sentences. Say we want to quote from this sentence, which defines the term gatekeeper. We might not improve on that definition by paraphrasing it, so we can quote it directly. The most important part is the definition itself. 
people who will look over your document before it's sent to the primary readers. But that piece about your immediate supervisor seems valuable too. Here's how I might combine those phrases into a single sentence. As you see, most of the sentence is still my own words. I've taken only what I need from the original. Because Dorwick, the original writer, isn't named within the sentence itself, I include her last name in the parenthetical citation. Once again, I'm using MLA style to format my parentheticals. With direct quotation, we want to incorporate our source material fluidly. That means we integrate the quotation naturally into the rhythm of our own sentence. We shouldn't be able to hear where the quotation marks appear. In this passage, which I've labeled as a bad example, we have two sentences, one from a student writer and one from a quoted source. This passage illustrates what we want to avoid, which is dropping in a quotation as its own standalone sentence. Although we as readers can recognize an ideological link between those two sentences, we need to work for it. The following revision makes that link clearer. Essentially, it combines the two sentences so we don't have that quotation sitting all alone by itself. The sentence reads more fluidly, and the quotation supports the claim that precedes it. A good rule of thumb is that you don't want a direct quotation to occupy more than a half or two-thirds of your sentence. When that happens, it might demonstrate that you haven't chosen the most important elements of the original quotation, or that you're filling space. There's no rule saying that you need to reproduce a full sentence or passage. You can shave off words from the front and back ends of your direct quotation. In fact, you should only use the words that are most valuable to your own argument. By including needless words, you add extra work for your reader. To prevent doctoring in a quotation as its own sentence, you can introduce it with a signal verb. For instance, as Graham claims. Since I note Graham's name within the sentence itself, I don't repeat Graham in the parenthetical citation. Yet if we imagine the sentence in the context of a longer report, we might question whether it clarifies the link between ideas. In this next example, we begin with an attribution, an introductory statement in the writer's own words, then the quotation itself. Reading that sentence to ourselves, we don't really hear where the quotation begins and ends, meaning we've effectively spliced it into our own expression. That fluency takes practice, but it's our goal in working with direct quotations. In order to make a quote fit into your text, you may need to alter it slightly to change a verb tense or turn a pronoun into a noun. When that happens, place square brackets around any changed word or words. In this first example, the original quote said that people search for it without a knife in hand. But in this new context, readers don't know what it stands for. As such, I've replaced the pronoun it with its referent, which in the original text was intimacy. Now the reader gets the full meaning of the quotation. Since we changed the original wording, but not its meaning, we use those square brackets to indicate the change. Sometimes you might want to excise a phrase or two, leaving out part of the quotation that's irrelevant to your argument. In that case, you would use ellipses points to indicate the deletion. Again, it's totally fine to shorten long quotations for the sake of creating a lean, concise argument. In this example, I deleted some needless explanation. By removing it, I kept my own sentence more direct and comprehensible. Note that you never place ellipses at the beginning or end of your quotation, since it's implied that you're selecting the passage from a longer work. Finally, if your original quotation already has quotation marks in it, that can be confusing for your reader. In turn, we change those double marks in the original into singles. Then it's clear where your direct quotation begins and ends. In academic contexts, the only use for single quotation marks is when we have quotes within a quote. Lately, I've noticed single quotes being used for soft emphasis or to indicate irony, which is only acceptable in informal, non-academic writing. Also, one quick side note, we cite authors by their last names, never their first. In this slideshow, I'm not discussing long quotes since you probably won't use them in your white paper. If you have a long passage, more than four or five lines that you want to cite, you might consider paraphrasing it instead. But if you're writing in another context, say a literature analysis, 
you might need to cite an entire paragraph. In that case, you would employ a block quote, which our textbook discusses briefly on page 389. However, block quotes tend to encourage readers to skim, they obscure the writer's own voice, and they make your teacher think you're trying to fill space. If we were an in-person class writing in the professions, we would view these two videos on understanding plagiarism from the University of Minnesota, where I taught before coming to Alaska Fairbanks. They provide quick, instructive overviews of how and why we cite our sources in academic writing. You can jot down the titles for these YouTube videos and locate them if you choose. There's no shortage of online sources, videos, tutorials, and articles about source citation. One is the online writing lab at Purdue University, which also has articles for grammar, mechanics, style, and tone. Our own writing center website, uaf.edu slash write, has links and resources as well. But if you don't want to go digging around the internet, our textbook provides an excellent, concise overview for documenting sources in Appendix A, which begins on page 385. In that section from our textbook, it notes that we cite sources for reasons of ethics, efficiency, and authority. In the working world, poor citation can lead to copyright violation, which will lead to a great headache. Here at the university, poor citation might lead to charges of plagiarism, defined as scholastic dishonesty. More specifically, plagiarism is the act of using someone else's thoughts, words, or research without giving them proper credit. The penalties range from failing an assignment to failing a course to, with repeated offenses, expulsion from the university. In my experience as a teacher, there are two types of plagiarism, intentional and accidental. Intentional plagiarism is cheating in the worst degree. For instance, claiming that you wrote a passage when in fact you pasted it from the internet, or taking your roommate's work from a different section and passing it off as your own. Intentional plagiarism is rare, but it's especially unethical. More common is accidental plagiarism, which results from good intentions but poor practice. For instance, you don't put direct quotes in quotation marks, or you forget citations for your paraphrases, or you appear to claim others' words and ideas as your own because you're working poorly within the conventions of MLA or APA style. When you accidentally plagiarize, it demonstrates a failure to achieve our learning objectives. If intentional plagiarism is like taking steroids, accidental plagiarism is like traveling or double dribbling. Both are violations of the rules, but one is much more egregious. Here in your first year writing courses, we stress the importance of documentation so you can develop good habits that will make the rest of your work easier and more productive here at UAF. How can you avoid plagiarism? The best way is probably to finish your final draft with a day or two to spare then visit with a tutor from UAF's Writing Center. That tutor will help you check the style of your citations and will treat it like a learning opportunity. Then you can correct your offenses before you submit your final draft for grading when the consequences for poor citation will be more severe. So what needs to be cited? In short, anything that's not common knowledge and anything that's not the result of empirical or primary research. That column on the left notes all the things we should cite. Direct quotations, paraphrases, ideas and little known or disputed facts, visual aids you borrow from a source, experiments and personal interviews. Yet I might disagree with the final two items. If you borrow the organization or structure from another source, you're getting rather close to plagiarism. Better that you create your own white paper structure based on the informational needs of your readers. And I'd say you don't need to acknowledge help or advice from an instructor or another student, since we assume that here in college you're collaborating and workshopping your assignment. In most cases, though, you're better off oversighting, since doing so will head off any suggestions of accidental plagiarism. Our textbook also has a section for what you should document on page 392. That concludes our discussion of research and documentation so let's close out this slideshow with a quick free writing activity. As always, I'm encouraging you to imagine that you could deliver your class projects to actual real world readers. When you conceive of audience, you begin to imagine how your document could be used outside of the classroom. It helps you make decisions about your content, language, and document design. 
For each of your previous assignments, you identified a specific reader or set of readers. And in each case, you tailored your document to those readers' needs and interests. As part of the pre-writing for your white papers, you've already located an ideal audience. For this activity, I'll ask you to write five sentences in which you directly address your readers. In those cases, you should use the word you. Although it might feel unnaturally saying you in academic writing, it's pretty standard in the workplace context. Our book even talks about the you perspective in short correspondence on pages 175 to 177. Using you is a good way of establishing context early on and engaging your reader. For example, say you're writing a report about separation anxiety and companion pets. You envision your report will be available at an animal shelter and your readers might include staff or new pet owners. With that in mind, you can say, as a new pet owner, you might be confused by your dog's reaction to certain stimuli. And if you're complete, concluding your report with a few recommendations, you could say, finally, you can take a few simple steps to ease your dog's transition to a new home. First, you can, second, you can, and so on. These usages of you are more likely to occur in the introduction and conclusion of your white paper. And that's it for this week. Thanks again for watching and please be in touch if you have any questions as you draft your white paper.